I feel that this week has been a bit emblematic of the topsy-turvy nature of our political scene. We've had Rishi Sunak, a Tory Prime Minister, suggest that the idea of tax cuts might be idiotic. We've had the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, say that he prefers Davos and rubbing shoulders with multi-millionaires to being in Westminster. And we've had a number of left-wing men in Parliament having a go at women for standing up for equality. What's going on there? We'll be discussing that and more over the next 90 minutes. We're going to bring in my paper reviewer in just a moment, Jenny Murray, former host of BBC's Woman's Hour and a Daily Mail columnist. But first, let's just go through the headlines. There's a bit of a mixed bag this morning. The Sunday Times goes with, it's like the First World War. If we kill them, they're just replaced, which is a report from Ukraine. Also a story on Boris Johnson. BBC boss helped arrange Johnson's £800,000 loan in Downing Street. Astonishing story. On the Observer front page, we've got Zahawi fights for his political life after admitting tax error. That story's picked up in a lot of the papers today. Sunday Telegraph headline, refugees and NHS at heart of diverse coronation. That's a key theme we're going to be discussing in just a moment. Front of the mail on Sunday, quite the splash. Andrew's bid to overturn sex abuse deal. That's a story that's also in The Sun. Got the mirror here, Sunday Mirror. Harry spun a tale over tailspin. That's to suggest that a story in his book Spare has been rather overblown by the Duke of Sussex. Sunday Express. King wants coronation to bring joy. That's been briefed by Buckingham Palace last night, so it makes a lot of the papers this morning. And as I said, the sun on Sunday, again using that story of the Duke of York, Andrew Plot's Virginia U-turn. Right, let's bring in Jenny Murray now. Jenny, thank you so much for joining me this morning. It's actually a really mixed bag of papers with some really good stories. Yeah, very, very strange. Now, we've known for a long time that Boris Johnson is often short of money and yes. needs some help yes. and all of that. Uh, the surprising thing about this is that he wanted an £800,000 loan. Yes. And so he asked for help from Richard Sharp, who became subsequently, subsequently being the operative word, yes. the chairman of the BBC. I mean, this is a Sunday Times story. It follows on from another report about him needing people to guarantee loans because he was in dire, fire, dire financial straits after his divorce, I think, from Marina Wheeler. But the idea that Sharp gets the post of chairman of the BBC after this... After helping with the £800,000, because Charles Moore was considered yes. to be the number one... Former editor of The Telegraph. Uh, to, yeah, of course, from The Telegraph. Um, and uh, that didn't happen. And Richard Sharp did get the job. Now, the BBC has nothing to do with who appoints the chairman. Sure. But the Prime Minister does. And he was at the time, I think, Mr Sharp, regarded as somewhat of a shoe-in. So it looks a little murky, let's put it that it way. It looks very, very <laughs> murky to me. I keep thinking of the word impartiality. What? Ooh, yes. You know, we've heard a lot of that from the BBC, but did it apply here? I don't know. Now, the other financial story, which is I have to say, completely baffled me, is the Nadim Zahawi yes. story. Uh, he has said he was simply careless. Not deliberate. Who is careless when it comes to tax? You know, when I first went freelance many, many years ago, I had some very good advice from a senior colleague who'd been freelance for a long time and looking after his own tax affairs. And he said, Jenny, let me tell you one thing. Mess with anybody, but never, ever mess with the inland revenue. But the and extraordinary you know, thing is he was Chancellor at the time that he paid back I this fine. So, he so sorry, he paid the tax and then he paid a fine. He was Chancellor for a very brief moment. It's extraordinary, this, isn't yeah, it? How could somebody with supposedly that financial knowledge be careless with his tax. You know, it, it's, obvious, it's a very complicated story. It's a company that it seems he and his father were involved yeah. in. You I mean, we, going into the weeds would take too long. Goodness knows the, what the, happened. The optics, Jenny, are appalling for him. Um, and I think he's, you know, people are asking him to consider his position as party chairman, and probably rightly so. Um, Follow-up story of the weekend. I would be really interested in your take on this because we have seen in Parliament some extraordinary scenes of Labour, a Labour MP, uh, Rosie Duffield, shouted down, and then Miriam Cates, who's on the Tory side. Both women standing up for women's equality, 
being shouted down in the House by men. And now we hear that one of Keir Starmer's aides tried to say that Rosie Duffield, who is in his own party, should, quote, spend less time hanging out with J.K. Rowling. They don't like us, do they, all these men? You know, they try to say they are, they're not misogynist, but actually, I think at the root of it, they are. Because this debate is really, really serious, and I've been involved in it for quite some time. I keep getting called a, a turf. Yeah, well, you're standing. a turf for standing up for women's rights. Yes, exactly. I, think, I think anybody that stands up for women's rights these days is sullied Because, like that. you know, what's worrying about this Scottish bill is somebody has called it, does it mean there'll be a Gretna Green for, tra for the trans community? Yeah. And this so is a gender can... recognition bill, which suggests that people can self-identify without necessarily having any medical interventions, and it also allows children as young as 16 That's to self-identify. That's the self -identify. most worrying, because 16-year-olds need safeguarding. Yes. They, you know, at the moment it's 18, you can't have you, you change your gender until you're 18. 16-year-olds have done it in the past and we know from Kira Bell yes who came out two or three years ago just how damaging it was she regretted she, transitioning she from female deeply, to male and she took hormones and now it's deeply regretted it and and had a double mastectomy and that is not reversible no and then in her 20s realized no she was a woman and you know we have to safeguard children and we have to safeguard women. I think those of us, whether it's J.K. Rowling or Rosie Duffield, all of us who have really fought hard to get this properly discussed yes. would have been much more open to the needs of trans women if they hadn't been so aggressive yes. about their campaign. And we've seen some if footage from the protests with sort of trans women shouting in women's uh, faces. Saying they want to kill us, uh, all kinds of horrible things, but also changing the language. You know, yeah. when they said, mm, uh, no, don't call them breasts, call them chests. Yes, and all chest the, feeding yeah, and... All of that stuff. People who menstruate, etc. And, and we just had to say, no, these are our words, this is our sex. And, and, just and you very, can't change your biological sex. Very briefly on that, Jenny, there was a headline, I think it was the Mail on Thursday, saying Labour has a woman's, woman problem. Do you agree with that? I, do you know, I, a lot of my friends who have been Labour supporters all their lives have been saying to me, what are we going to do at the next yeah. election? Who am I... Politically it, lost. It, uh, politically lost. Let's quickly move on to the next one, just because time is pressing, as is ever the case. Um, Telegraph front page, refugees and NHS are the heart of a diverse coronation. It's interesting, this. Obviously, um, the King wants to make it more inclusive and diverse than it would have been in 1953, which is no bad thing. No, I, I, I watched it on the telly in 1953. It oh, may wow. astonish you to know that... It does astonish I was me. Don't look old enough, Jenny. Three, well, I am. I was three years old when the and Queen was... And do you remember it quite clearly? My dad was a, an electrician in a local television shop. He mended televisions. He went on to become an engineer. But we were the only people in our street who consequently had a telly. Wow. The entire street came into our front oh, room. Oh, wonderful. We were so crowded because it wasn't a very big house. And we watched the Queen be crowned. And I just thought it was amazing and i loved her ever since from, yes from that do you day. love the king as much well i i have i interviewed him once and i liked him very much actually camilla i should call her the queen consort now yes um i've met her several times i mean she got a I lot of stick from prince harry in his book do you think that was deserved <sighs> no Absolutely not, that silly little boy. Um, <laughs> Jenny. <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't be quite so dismissive, but why not? I am dismissive of him. No, she's terrific. And he is going to ensure that she is crowned alongside him. So it's going to be a diverse coronation. There's going to be lots of excitement. I th what did he say he wanted it to be? Um, he wanted to be something that would light up the nation. Yes. And, oh, boy, does this nation and need... And leave a legacy, because he's got a plan there for the big help out, I think, which is going to take place on the Monday of the weekend, where he wants people to volunteer, and he hopes yeah. that that might set in train people doing a bit more for their communities. And we do need thing. the nation lit up yes, right we do. now.
Yes, do we, we do. Not? We, we need the boost, don't we, in May? <laughs> we do. You chose for opinion piece of the day in the Telegraph, Suella Braverman's her op-ed on police reform. Now, is it going to be enough? I'm going to be speaking to Palm Sandu a little later in the show, a former officer with the Met Police, to talk about this horrific David Carrick case. I mean, the reputation of the police right now, regardless of any of the Home Secretary's efforts, is at an all-time low. How can it be repaired? Uh, she's saying she hopes to um, make... Uh, getting rid of bad policemen easier. She's going to review police dismissals. Why so late? We have yes. known what's been going on for a very long time. I mean, this bloke was nicknamed, I won't say it because it's breakfast telly, but B something I Dave. Know. So he had this reputation for being a complete wrong -un within the ranks... And he stays in this job for 20 years. There was the most extraordinary testimony from one of his victims in the mail yesterday, a double-page spread, which the uh, deputy chief reporter had done. This woman's experience at the hands of this monster was one of the most disturbing pieces of copy I've read in a long time. But to make matters worse, he remained in uniform throughout. It's astonishing, isn't it? And we know that, you know, uh, Mr Riley has been saying oh, it's terribly difficult to dismiss them. Yeah, Why right. is it difficult to dismiss them? Just sack them. You yes. know, since Sarah Everard, what did I read this morning? There have been 16 Met officers convicted since Sarah Everard's murder. And yet still, <laughs> the Home Secretary is saying, oh, well, uh, you know, we need to review this. We need to make it better. We've heard it all yeah. before. Do you think it has an effect as well on women's safety. We already know that women don't feel particularly safe at night. Do you think it erodes generally women's faith in the police, not least when we've got things like rape convictions at an all-time low? Well, you know, when, when the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police says he cannot guarantee that if you go to the police to say you've been attacked, you've been raped, you've had some sort of sexual attack, he can't guarantee that the person, the man you're reporting to, is someone who has never committed a sexual crime. Mm. That is terrifying. Who do you go to if you can't trust the police? No, I know. And I think that's one of the reasons why Carrick was, being, was able to get away with so much. I mean, the lady who spoke to the mail under the conditions of anonymity basically said that her father had been a police officer and she trusted him because he was a copper, because he was in uniform and kept on making pledges that he would protect her. Actually, he subjected her to the most degrading and inhumane treatment I've ever read about. Locked in a cupboard. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable what he did to her. Um, another um, theme of the weekend's papers, as you would expect, is the NHS. And there's this extraordinary picture that you've chosen for photo of the day. Let's just take a look at it now. Now, this is, I believe, an NHS doctor lying down with all of the paperwork that he needs to fill out in order to discharge a patient from hospital. And I think the doctor looks like he's a good six foot and he is dwarfed by this paperwork. Jenny, have you ever seen anything like it in your life? Uh, well, I actually was once on the board of an NHS hospital and we struggled and struggled and struggled as... It became more and more bureaucratic, more and more difficult. The demands from all the different associations that have something to say about the way the NHS, yes. whether it's the Confederate or this or that. Um, it was horrific because the only thing that mattered to all of us on the board and to all the doctors that we knew was we need to be treating patients. Yes. We need Not to be filling treating out forms. patients quickly. Not filling out forms. And yet still, it's going on. But I thought it's such a good way of demonstrating it's that. A very Imagine good you're picture. trying to treat patients, but you're also doing all of that bureaucracy. It's total yeah. madness. Jenny Murray, thank you so much for joining My me this pleasure. morning. It's been an absolute pleasure.